I've been two toddlers, two dogs, two cats, two parents, right. one sister. <laughs> I went from total solitude in the bush for like weeks to full family. Live right now. Okay, we are live right now. So we're gonna give everybody 30 seconds to join the chat and then I'll jump in. This is like the quiet, super quiet speaking. I We're not just staring at you, promise. <laughs> this beautiful back of people. It's okay. Not a sore for sight eyes. But uh, the 30 seconds is up. So I'm going to welcome everybody to the Arctivism, Ally Shipping Canadian Contemporary Arts Culture, an art and cultural space. Uh, I'm just going to call it like a fireside chat with everybody, couch to couch. Um, one thing I want to say is that this is not a conversation created to do the work for others, uh, though I am fully aware that it's going to be highly informative and educational and insightful for our viewers, but rather this is a candid, a candid dialogue for those who have practiced disrupting the status quo. Uh, and we are looking to unpack their journeys and discover how their personal accountabilities, their experiences um, have brought them to a space of leadership, notable success and change making. Uh, I'll start by saying thank you to Harborfront for continuously creating space and supporting our visions. Thank you to TD Bank Group for continuously funding important platforms and putting their money where their mouth is. And uh, definitely shout out to Trey Anthony. And I hope she's watching there. I know she's with her baby tonight, but uh, Trey Anthony has been an advisor for me for many years and is now my partner in crime um, and who's, who's co-curating this series with me. And I just want to also call out that this is an ongoing series called The Mic Is On. Uh, which is there to amplify voices that need to be heard in a time where everything is recorded. So the next one coming up is Trey's on Saturday at 7.30. That one's called Raising Our Black Sons, White and Black Mothers Speak. Uh, and while you're in harborfront.live, you can scroll to the bottom, you can see the ones that are coming up next. And you can also, if you've missed the first two, you can go and see the live links um, that get posted from those chats. So jumping into this, um, I'm kind of going to single out ESMA here. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because while me and Trey were creating this series, Esma had um, an interesting interaction on social media where she uh, decided to call out uh, a gallery specifically. Uh, I'm just going to throw it out there. It was the Susan Hobbs Gallery. And I thought it was a really interesting dialogue to have because it was, it, it was in the time when we were being triggered with what we call performance allyship. And uh, I really want to jump into to what happened there, Esma. Uh, just because this is what prompted this panel today. And it's, it's, it's now allowed me to bring on different voices, including Esqua, Esqua, Esqua. I love her, that's one of my besties, so I can mess up her name. Julie and <laughs> Ravi. Um, but it, it did spawn from this conversation that, and this dialogue that was happening between Esma and the Susan Hopp Gallery. So uh, I want to start by getting into that, Esma, with you. And I want to know also, what are your thoughts on the importance of, um, or I guess, what are your, what are your thoughts um, on the contemporary art space from galleries to public art installations and such and their placement of black voices and why you thought it was necessary to get into that conversation? Well, you know, I think we have a large problem in Canada specifically around black artists and representation. I think there's a like extreme lack of black artists that are being represented and it's actually because of collectors. Like in the States, collectors value black art and want to buy black art. Therefore, gallerists are picking up black artists and black artists are getting work and making sales here the case is different so collectors are not valuing black art as they should be they're not buying as much black art as they should be so um gallerists are then not you know recruiting black artists and you know the city goes with there are just so many black young artists who are so good who are being overlooked just because they're black and because the market isn't actually wanting black art um, in Canada. And that's just the reality. And we, you know, we shy away from it and we don't really want to talk about it. And it's really hard to have these conversations, but I think these conversations are important. And I think that, you know, we all exist in this cycle with gallerists, collectors, the viewers, the artists, the curators, and it all is a, is a large cycle. And I think that it, if like one piece doesn't fit in, then the rest doesn't. 
So I think that, you know, it starts, in my opinion, with collectors and changing their outlook and their understanding of the value of Black art. And then as will follow is um, gallerists and then Black artists will then become represented. But until that happens, you know, it's going to it's going to take a large shift. I can't hear you. That's Zoom. right. Zoom. Yeah, there you go. So I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to Julie after this and touch on that. But just to follow up on that point specifically, the re the like exact points, but in terms of the performance shift that happened with that like with that situation, why did you feel the need to call it out then? I felt the need to call it out because it was frustrating for me to see. Like I'm rep I have a gallerist and I'm represented, but I know so many black artists that aren't represented. So when I see these galleries posting these black squares in solidarity, claiming that Black Lives Matter. Well, how do Black Lives Matter if you're not actually representing Black artists? So to me, it was just completely fake and I'm not with the fake shit. So I had to call her out. And I just think that the email that she had sent to a friend of mine regarding um, her lack of diversity in her roster um, was really what triggered the calling out because it was so vile. It was attacking. It was um, accusatory. It was just so many things that was wrong with that email and not how you actually approach these things. I think that gallerists need to now come from a position of listening and hearing rather than doing the talking. And she, rather than listening, she actually talked back in a way that was really disgusting. And I just, I couldn't sit by and just let it happen. Right. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for that, Asma. Okay. Um, this now brings me to the reason I said Julie was next because we had a, we had a pretty um, good conversation yesterday. And I know Julie's focus is like decolonizing institutions and really stepping into leadership roles. So when I say right now for a place of leadership, which you kind of have as one of your latest roles as being like the inaugural artistic director for 2021 Nui Blanche, can you explain what change you feel can be made from sitting in positions like these? And how do you see these positions having a role in decolonizing institutions and the gallery system really? Yeah, I think first and foremost, I think what Esma's saying is super important. The reality is, is that, you know, that it's kind of this, um, you know, lip service that comes from these institutions. And then they always are asking, you know, which artists would you recommend? Who would you like to work with? Or, you know, just basically mining your cultural information on a regular basis, but not compensating you properly, not putting you in a leadership role not giving you an opportunity in terms of to be able to speak your voice and be at the table, the important table where the decisions are being made. And the conversation that we had earlier, and I've been saying a lot on Zoom, which I'm going to say again, it's like, I don't want to be included. We don't want to be included. We want to be running it. We want to be in charge of what it is that we're doing. We also want an important stake at that table to sit there and make those leadership decisions. And I'd say to flip that into the city of Toronto and the inaugural artistic directing, it's been awesome. You know, the opportunity in terms of Nui has had a good history in terms of working with a diverse group of artists and curators. Some of you have been involved in that in different aspects. Uh, some of you that are even on the call. And I'd say that, you know, the their excitement around thinking about that was for me, what I was interested in proposing was an entire BIPOC Nui focus. And so the team was super jacked, excited about that. And I think that when you're in those positions of power, it's your, um, I wouldn't say obligation, but it's something that inspires me to want to mentor and make space and make sure that there's room for new people coming into it. And just what Esma said, like she might have representation, but there's so many artists that don't have representation. There's so many missed opportunities. You know, some artists, especially coming from marginalized communities, we don't want to actually promote ourselves and talk about ourselves and network in the same sort of environments that other artists are used to doing. You know, we want people to have a real investment and part of the reason I had taken the position at um, the city of Toronto for Nuit Blanche was I was actually offered a different position with an organization that just didn't give a shit about any of the work that I had done. All they wanted was a nice, shiny, indigenous focused event. And they didn't actually want to decolonize. Uh, they didn't want to collaborate. They didn't want it to be in partnership. And I was like, why would I want to work with this uh, organization when I have this incredible Nui team and a shout out to you guys because you guys are all awesome over there. They do such good work and it's just like they're inviting me to give me the space, have the budget and the platform to be able to do the opportunities that I need to do. And I think that that just provides a new platform for upcoming artists, established artists, um, mid-career artists, because even established artists, especially racialized, 
established artists aren't getting those opportunities the same way that non-racialized artists are. And in particular, you know, not to pick on the white guys, but it's kind of the situation in terms of the who gets that space. And I think that the institutions that put those hollow statements out, they're hollow. If you know that you're doing good work, you you, you don't actually have to put the statement out. <laughs> wow. Anyways, I'll leave it there. <laughs> Which is, it, it's interesting because, and, and I'm going to jump to Esquay afterwards, but the idea of not putting out a statement, I think, do you run yourself at risk of being called out, right? Like if you are doing the work, um, it's still a time where you have to, I think, at, maybe amplify what your mandate is. But I'm not, I'm not sure. This is why this discussion is open, right? Because um, I think that there's different ways of, of exemplifying allyship. And if, as an organization that's been doing it, um, I don't know if it necessarily means that you got to step back and, and not voice the the reasoning that you've been doing it and why you've been doing it for the past 10, 15, 20 years, um, because it's it's educational for the other institutions to realize why that mandate was set in the first place, because this this whole oppression um, is happening because of these microaggressions and, and, and the idea that certain institutions or galleries or cultural spaces were not doing the work um, parallel to others that were. Um, but speaking, now jumping into Isquay, I'm speaking of platforms um, and different ways of showing leadership. One, congratulations on your recent Juno for Little Star, for Little Ooh. Star video. Uh, yes, applaud that. Um, the reason though that that deserves such a big applause is because the story behind that video. And what I think is really interesting is that you've been using your artistry to address violence and inequality and justice for Indigenous communities in Canada for like over a decade. Um, however, your approach to your art has varied, including how you decide to showcase like your, the storyline that was in Litter Star. Can you tell us about the creative decisions made with that video and why it was important for you to show it that specific way? Because I think it's very interesting, um, your approach to these things. Hmm. So the song, the song began, I was at the BAMP Center doing a residency with my band and at that time, mm -hmm. Um, two white men were on trial for the murders of two, like two separate men were on trial for the murders of two separate indigenous youth. And while, while we were there, um, both men were acquitted by juries that did not consist of any indigenous people whatsoever. And they both, both um, murders took place in very, highly populated indigenous area. So one of them was here in Winnipeg, which you know has per capita the biggest indigenous population in all of Canada. And, or maybe that's a dated stat, but a very high population. And then the other took place, so Treaty 1 right here, and then Treaty 6 in Saskatchewan. Again, very high numbers of indigenous representation. So the fact that on these juries, there was no representation just shows the, the discrepancy of, of how um, how we're viewed, how we're represented in society um, when, when things go down. So while we were there, at the time of these trials, the Globe and Mail specifically, and there were some other, um, other media outlets as, hmm? other, other media people. outlets that, including Facebook, were, were running, I mean, Facebook was a separate thing, but the, the media outlets were running really detrimental headlines representing the two youth that had been killed. So setting them, setting that narrative that allowed people to focus on blood alcohol content and you know things like that, that have nothing to do with the fact that they were both young <laughs> and are dead. So you know, for me at the end of the day, when I see that, what I'm actually watching is I'm saying, I'm seeing the way society is like, okay, well, we don't have enough understanding to recognize that this is messed up. We don't have enough, enough understanding to recognize that all of the messages that we get from our media, from our school boards, from you know, all of the places that we get information, we're being pumped stereotypes and we're being pumped detrimental messages so that the, the young, like our bodies aren't valued, our humanity isn't valued. So all of that to be said, all of that was happening for me emotionally. I was feeling really, um, really torn up for like, you know, a very minimalist sense of how I felt like I was devastated by these. And, but then at the same time, I was also really depleted of being like, depleted by, you know, always being like 
on the front line, really always being, you know, out there battling this, this fight that feels endless sometimes. And what I felt was really important was to talk about some beautiful elements of culture in this story, right? So I could find, I was trying to find ways to slip in elements of culture. So the song's called Little Star. And in Cree, which is the, which is my language, the, the word for that is um, achikosis. And it, we have this teaching in Cree culture that we're the descendants of the star people. So when you look up in the sky and you see, you know, shooting stars or movement, what you're seeing is movement between spirit, movement of spirit between the walking world and the sky world. And so with this song, in, in uh, before it became the video, that's what I really wanted to hold on to. I wanted to hold on to this this element of beauty that I could I could share with people and say like this is something that really meant a lot to me growing up that I identify with that sits with me in my everyday. And so it was something that I was able to address as a means to talk about this really hard conversation as well, right? Like in an attempt to gather some empathy and, and a sense of you know, recognition of our humanity, I guess. So when the video came to be, I was working with, excuse me, uh, director Sarah Legault and we were chatting excuse me, we were chatting about how it could go and what, what, what it could look like. And for me, I really, you know, I, I, I was so grateful for her because she was really intuitive to pulling these, these, not, these elements of culture and bringing them forward into this video. So for those who haven't seen it, it's a stop motion piece and it has 42 um, handmade puppets that are a representation of, you know, like kind of like, the best representation of humanity is as we could get into 42 puppets. So you have all walks of life of children. And the storyline of this video is that these children are walking down the street. So you have, you have the two indigenous youth representation of the two indigenous youth whose lives were taken that this story is specifically referencing. But then you also had this collection of youth who came together and while they're walking through the cityscape, they're looking up and they're seeing all of these messages, all of these headlines that were actual headlines being run at the time of these trials. And they have been created to be the wallpaper of all of the buildings. So as they're walking downtown, they're looking up and reading all of this messaging that society is constant, constantly bombarding them with, right? And it's only once they start to help each other up because they're all feeling really saddened and heavy by seeing this, only once they start to kind of bind together and gather together, the, the, we see this, this, these messages start to crumble and fall off the building. And so, yeah, it's like, you know, my hope with this is that there will be a, you know, that, that there's ways to create space for that conversation of beauty so that for those who don't recognize that that lack of empathy exists for them, they'll find, my hope is that they'll start to bring in that sense of empathy. Beautiful. Yeah, that's beautiful. Um, uh, because this conversation is also like unpacking our, our processes um, as artists and creators and facilitators, uh, I think that that is a good, thank you for sharing that process. That's why I think that's beautiful. Um, but I also, want to hear a different side too um, when it comes to uh, Ravi, uh, the work that you do in theater. So similar to Esque, you've been kind of focusing a lens and supporting BIPOC artists uh, for 13 years. Um, and similar to Esque, I kind of want to know what your experience, your personal mandate was when starting this journey, not just you're an award-winning director and you've had several um, pieces that you've directed that focused on the BIPOC lens, uh, but also with Why Not Theatre as you moved into being an artistic director for them. Uh, I'm really interested to understand because even now, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead because that this will be a question for you later, even now you believe that there's a lot of work to do within Why Not Theatre, even though you guys have been doing the work for so long. And it, I know it wasn't the initial, um, like the first, the first, um, it wasn't the initial thing for you when you were in Why Not Theater, uh, but can you kind of explain what the personal mandate was when you started that journey with your own personal pieces and with Why Not Theater? Yeah, um, so, uh, you know, I grew up in Toronto, but then I had left uh, to go abroad to train 
And uh, I had worked with some really fantastic international artists. And so when I came back to Toronto, um, it, no one wanted to work with me because all they saw was a, a brown artist. And so I was constant, all the institutions really kind of pushed me aside and I had to form my own company. And forming that company was really to challenge the notion of, uh, you know, how you see me and what, where, where the power of the storyteller lies is in the ability to tell our own stories from our own perspectives. So a lot of what we did was pull together um, people to challenge what stories are being told and who gets to tell them. And so in doing that, it was really about, um, yeah, just fighting for my own space and making space for, for the voices of other people because, you know, uh, theater is, theater in particular of all the arts is like maybe the whitest one. I mean, maybe that's a whole battle we can have, but I feel like, um, uh, because historically, it's just it's just hasn't made space for for these voices in in those buildings, and um, so for for me uh, th that's been a big driving force. And then and then also just kind of referencing the the statements, and you know we we struggled when the statements came because we also had that feeling of like you know we don't need to do that because we've been doing the work. However, you know I'm a person of color and I'm a South Asian man, and my proximity to whiteness is very different. Um, obviously than a black person or an indigenous person. And so we, we decided to make a vow to reaffirm actually our vows and commitments to black and indigenous artists. Uh, and and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, pos our, our, and our positionality in the conversation. And so how do we as, uh, how do we focus on the work that we need to do for ourselves and the people while we, yes, sure, we, we work with black artists and indigenous artists and people of color and we're fighting for those voices, but we still have work to do as well. And how do we ensure that we're looking at ourselves, looking at, at our systems in our organization, which is a safe space, even, even though we might feel we're a safe space or we're told we're a safe space, no doubt we've inherited and learned white supremacist culture, white supremacist biases and ways of view and, and ways of seeing. So we constantly have to be fighting uh, our own selves in order to really take this fight on. So right now we're trying to really do, we're, we're restructuring our organization entirely and, and rethinking power structures, which, which also addresses um, the traditional structures of boards and really need to, we, I think this is the time to rethink everything because we have to say everything we've inherited is white supremacist lenses, views, structures. So how do we rethink everything? Right. Um, and because now, because you started talking about like things on a board level and at like a structural level, I'm kind of interested to know too, I'm just going to jump into this community question as well, because both you and I come from very similar um, backgrounds. And I think I still find it really interesting that you feel that there, there is work to do for everyone, but you feel that there's so much work to do uh, with the community or, or theater organization that's already been doing the work for so long. And then we have kind of like the performance aspects of a lot of corporations, a lot of brands, um, uh, and larger institutions that have kind of just like, like Esma said, put up the black box, uh, sent a very surface message saying that we stand by black and indigenous and BIPOC artists and all of that, yet your organization haven't, hasn't done that. And I, I kind of want to, and I, I'm not saying that this is for everybody, but I think that there's something to be said about fostering individuals from a community level. And I know you and I have spoken about that. Both of us have worked with Manifesto. We've gone through the family of the remix. Um, a space that is, oh, sorry, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get my question together here. <laughs> um, I guess the difference between being fostered through the community, um, through the community sector and, and like actually fostering community versus through theater and dance and all of like, like you said, theater and dance might be a little bit lower on the scale, though I don't agree, um, versus uh, I guess that the intentions uh, and the new mandates that are coming out from corporate organizations, like what's the very, because you talk about white supremacy and like, that is white supremacy lives within the corporate environment. So really, what are the two key differences there for you? I mean, something that, so, so you know, as you mentioned, you know, I was really lucky when I came back to Toronto, 
manifesto was forming. Remix had just moved into a, was moving into a new building. So I was around, I was really fortunate to be around a lot of people who were at the highest level of artistic practice, black people, indigenous people, people of color who were, you know, really amazing international artists, but all invested in mentorship and their own communities, their own, uh, um, localities even within Toronto, they were invested in as they grew, they brought up their own communities. And that's something I think about, and it kind of relates to something Esma was saying about institutions. Like, I think that, that uh, uh, I, I heard an indigenous artist, uh, Gordon Patrick White, he was talking about how uh, there's, there's an idea that uh, there was a separation between artists and community that happened because of institutions. And that actually, we need to bring back the idea of artists in community that it's all medicine, it's all part of storytelling, it's all one thing. And this separation of the institution and the, uh, that the, sorry, separation of artists from community that institutions does and did um, is a real breaking of that bond. And so you look at a lot of these corporate sort of institutions, they don't really have communities. No. They have donors, they have um, audiences they have to please, but it's a different relationship. Um, and, and it's one that I think, uh, you know, all, all the sort of companies, culturally specific companies that are not part of institutions have really strong roots in community, in all the different communities. And I think that's something we really need to think about as we dismantle these structures. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for uh, diving into that a bit more. I'm going to switch back to Esma. Um, I'm really interested to, we, when we spoke there's obviously, there's the whole idea again of tokenism versus um, ally, allyship. Uh, and like as an artist, for, for those who don't know, uh, she was recently acquired as a piece was acquired, a, a seat above the table into the AGO as, in, as a part of their permanent collection. And when we spoke, uh, just kind of about how your, like your take on battleism, battle, battling tokenism and being labeled as a black artist, uh, you've even taken a stance back from even doing Black History Month exhibitions and kind of being tokenized and, and, in that way. Can you tell us a bit about your choice to do that and why you feel that that's necessary for your work as a Black artist? Not as a Black artist, but not as a Black artist. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So, you know, I kind of came to a point where I was realizing a trend with institutions where they would call on Black artists to do their February month slot show and then we wouldn't be represented in their collections. We wouldn't be represented in regular programming. We wouldn't be represented in regular exhibitions. And why was that? And I kind of had to sit back and ask myself, what am I really participating in? Am I participating in being a token? And if so, I need to be realize that and actually take a, take a step back. So from that moment on, I just said, I'm not going to do these Black History Month shows because you put me in this tiny, 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 tiny box. Label me as a Black artist, pull me out to check a box, that says we're not racist and I'm not gonna help you do that. So I kind of had to take a step back and go, respect me like you would respect any other white artist, give me the proper slot that I deserve based on the merit of my work and we can have a show. Otherwise asking me to do a Black History Month show during Fe a show, anytime a show during February, I find extremely insulting. Um, so I've kind of stepped back unless of course it's, done by black curators for black people for us by us but when these white institutions come and call us to do this and we're not reflected in their collections i take it as an insult right and you also mentioned something about the, the fact that like your work also unpacks beyond racism right like you talk about economics and sexuality in your work too are you feeling like that's being overlooked as like again a quote unquote a black artist and you have to deal with that specific topic all the time Totally, because you know my work isn't just about race, it's also about sexuality, about gender, about economics. And we don't go tell white artists that they're white artists. We just call them yeah. artists. You know, they, make, they can make work about geology. I don't go, you're a geologist artist. I just go, <laughs> you're an artist. So why am I constantly called a black artist? It just it doesn't make sense to me. I'm a sculptor, I'm an artist, and I happen to make work about racial politics, and I happen to make work about economics and sexuality and gender. But so much of that gets eclipsed by the fact that I'm black. Right, right. So seeing the artist um, like as a whole, right? Exactly. Uh, and on that note too, I feel like there's like for me, and I think every, I can confidently say speaking to all of you and having a 
personal relationship with most of you. Um, it is daunting. It is so tiring um, uh, to do this work all of the time, but we, we do it because we love it and because we want to, and it's part of our personal um, responsibilities that we've now taken on. Um, so now, like when I pivot over to Isque and acknowledging the amount of work that you've been doing for so long and understanding that um, once we take these positions and roles of responsibilities, we inherently then become accountable for our actions to our audiences, mm -hmm. right? So do you feel that you've sacrificed your career and put opportunities at risk for standing up for the things that you believe in? And then I also am going to second, I will repeat this in case it's too much. <laughs> I want to also know how that's affected because we've had a lot of questions about your, your own mental health and the battling of, of, of all of this and having to carry that weight. But question number one, um, the sacrifices and the risks that you feel like you've had to put your career because you've stood by um, your decision to, to take on this responsibility and accountability. Yeah, I think kind of to to uh, agree or or I don't know what the word is. I'm losing my word here with U.S. Met, but the the idea of being labeled by your culture or color or language group or you know like whatever it is that someone's gonna be able to grasp and then you know follow that with the word artist. It's just like no, that there's. And it's because it centers whiteness, right? It, it really does. It separates, it's an us and them mentality that gives that gives the others a an opportunity to say, there's this group over here. Like you said, we can check off the boxes. We can do all of these things because we've now established what their demographic is, exactly. right? And yeah, and I mean, for me, it was one that I've, you know, I've battled that a lot obviously. Um, I haven't battled it from a sense of, you know, I'm the first one to acknowledge that I'm not a person of color. I don't walk into a room and people don't look at me and go, there's an indigenous person right there. I understand that. I, I was raised to be very aware of that and to be very um, uh, careful with, with how I, how I maneuver through that privilege, right? And and the way that I was taught to do that was to use that as like my sneak attack. It's my it's my way to pop up in a room and be like, surprise, I'm the person that you're talking about right now. And these are my family members. These are my, this is my community and we're gonna have a really big chat now. And so it started long, long ago before, you know, before I became an artist or like an artist as a career, I should say. And I really learned a lot of those lessons as a kid by, being in that position time and time again and so you know as I made my way through and found my way in art I very quickly realized that you know there was a, a small window of time where I was like I'm just gonna make music and I was you know I was living in Los Angeles and I was being guided by every every single other human being that had an idea of what I should do. And I was like, great, I'll do that. Sure, I'll do that. And none, none of it connected to me. And it was only once I came back and I was like, you know what, these, there's these things that I need to, to address. I need to talk about this. I connected to the art. And then in that moment, recognized very quickly what I had just done, <laughs> right? In terms of yeah. like yeah. My, my career train and my career path. And it's been a very, very slow uphill climb. I've watched peers surpass. I've watched friends surpass because they opted to not be so political. And, you know, there's, there is zero judgment on that because we all have our purpose and we all have our paths and this is mine. And, and it's been a beautiful one that I wouldn't change for the world. And it's, it's a, a very exhausting one and it's very, you know, it depletes, you know, it, it depletes a lot of spirit, but, you know, at the same time, as, as I say that, I also have, you know, my elders who help me through that and help, you know, provide me with tools so that I can continue to make my way down that path and, and down that journey. Um, but to, you know, long story long, to answer your question, Ash, yeah. it, it is, it's, it's slow, it's slow and steady. And, and I've seen lots of, you know, lots of movement happening around. Um, and then to answer question number two, it, it does impact my mental health. You know, like I, I was recently diagnosed with depression, anxiety, and PTSD. And, um, and it's something that is, you know, when I'm, when I'm constantly 
rooted and present in community issues and community and uh, um, well, the things that are going on. It's 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 hard to find separation for myself, right? Because it's like, you know, I'm, as I'm sure everybody here can relate to, it's like when something, when you're attached to something because it, it's here in your heart and in your soul, there's no moment where I can just be like, mm, I'm done, I'm just gonna close the computer for today. Like it doesn't just disappear at the end of the day. So it's, it's a tough balance finding, finding your footing when, um, you know, when, when a, a huge part of what you do is standing up for the ones that you love all right. the time. And I do think there's something to be said to like as it pertains to mental health and like our personal accountabilities. Like all of us here have obviously um, we have a lot of personal accountabilities. That's why we do the work that we do. Yeah. Um, but understanding to when you know what you're doing and you you feel like at, for this present time nothing is there's gonna always be more. There's always there's more. more. There's always more. something to tackle. There's always more that gets targeted. Mm -hmm. uh, but understanding when you've done you've done enough right now. Yeah, you break you step back and you go back in, right? We're still going to stay accountable to the work we do. Um, it's a tough one though, because it's like, especially in this age of social media, where you know, you have all of these like click police who are watching your every step of the way, and, and they're like, Well, you didn't say something in the last right. 12 minutes, so you clearly right. hate so and so. And I'm like, Oh my gosh, like, you know, no, I'm, I'm taking a shower right now, like, right. I, you know, like. <laughs> But it's, right. it can be so intense all the time. And I think it's really important to just provide ourselves with boundaries. And again, it's, it, it comes down to knowing in your heart of heart what your path is, right? Like I always say, um, it's, it's important to know what your relationship is with whatever being it is that you look to. You know, if it's, you know, my word would be creator. So for me, my relationship with creator is between me and creator. And I know that my heart is where it is. So for somebody, if somebody's going to be like, well, you're not doing enough, I'm gonna be like, well, I, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I have to, I can only do so much as one human being. And, and I think that's important for us all to, everybody who's out there, you know, fighting a good fight you have to have a boundary for yourself so that you can regenerate and replenish in order to keep going. Cause you're not going to do anybody any good if you, you know, aren't around anymore or if you can't get out of bed anymore or, you know, whatever those things might be. Right. And I think too, that the, the key part is there is that, um, and it, again, bringing it back to this whole topic of performance versus meaningful allyship and like action is mm -hmm. like, it's, all, all, all of you are, are speaking tonight because your, your work is, is and, and what you do is with intention and action um, and meaningful action. And I think that that's the difference between being a performer and like putting performance allyship and, and, and staging something rather than actually um, creating um, change and doing, and doing the work. Uh, also, like, I, I'm, I'm just gonna, quickly say this too, like this whole, this whole thing that this panel came together and like why Esma spawned it too, like the reaction to what I saw from Esma was something I had to digest and look at the best way to do that. Like, am I going to go and I'm going to go respond on Instagram, I'm going to put it in my story and like it lasts for a day and then it's gone and swift, it's gone. Or am I going to create something that's a little bit more lasting with time um, that can, that can service more people, service more and that can give her a better voice as well to, 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 to voice her concerns around what happened. So I think I, I completely, just to say, I completely agree with that. Um, speaking about, uh, I guess, the way that we're, we're doing our work, I wanna jump back to Julie. I'm really interested in what you do with Glam, Julie, because I, I know what you do with Nuit, and I, I you're on mute, by the way, so make sure you unmute yourself before I get into this question. No um, worry, I'm in, I'm literally <laughs> in the bush, and there's people driving by trying to get there's the same wool. Wi-Fi signal as I have right now, and I was like, can you leave? I'm on a live talk. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, get your own section of the bush. I know, I was like, this, this is mine. Go somewhere yeah. else. I got to say, though, that's love and intention to actually take a break from your, your uh, you're kind of like the resort living up there. To come into the um, but your work is kind of like widely focused on like curatorial activism and in indigenous mythologies, mythologies across uh, Canada and internationally. 
a big part of that is what you do with glam. So can you tell us a little bit more about what glam is and, and how it's kind of like dismantling right now? Sure, I know that both the glam ladies are listening. So uh, Heather Gugliarte and Carla Taunton, this one goes out to you. Uh, we are a group of, uh, yeah, exactly, a group of scholars that uh, um, just want to do incredibly important work that have a strong relationship with each other and have this kind of ability to be able to just have this reciprocal trust. And you guys talked a little bit about allyship. And so one of our members is, is uh, non-Indigenous. And so, you know, for us, it's just so important that we each take up our own role and the way that we work and the way that we actually finish each other's sentences. And so GLAM stands for Galleries, Libraries, Archives and Museums. You know, we also make jokes because we, um, <laughs> you know, we also like fancy things and like to have wine and sit and chat. And so we kind of felt like Glam was a good name for us. And so, you know, we've done these uh, really great work where we're, we have um, incubators where we invite six to nine artists into a specific spot. We've done them in Montreal and Halifax. Uh, we did also, we had one of the events in Toronto. Uh, we're looking at doing some work within um, Vancouver, uh, New Zealand, Australia, um, Norway. So, you know, we've, we've had this incredible opportunity where we not only get to critically write and engage with it, but we mentor new and upcoming BIPOC um, uh, curators. So we work with, uh, we've had about five so far. And so we're gonna kind of continue that path uh, in, in just opening up more opportunities for, um, for them and their experiences. And so what we do is kind of rogue, you know, we, we take over uh, night festivals. We've done stuff where we've taken over Nuit Blanche in Montreal and had a whole section of primarily Inuit artists and Caroline, our uh, inaugural Algonquin artist. And then we've had, then we uh, took everybody over to Halifax and did uh, Nocturne and um, Art in the Open in Charlottetown. So we, we get really excited and we just kind of do a long intensive, you know, 10 days straight create whatever you can create and people will actually collaborate and work together and we intentionally pick uh, emerging local artists with mid-career and senior established artists to see what they can come up with and so for us that is important work it operates within the kind of anti-oppressive methodologies feminist methodologies indigenous methodologies where we collaborate and we trust each other and it actually goes against the principles of what Ravi said earlier of white supremacy like if we think about individualism that whole concept you know, when we originally applied for our first grant together, we got a lot of kickback from within the academic community saying, oh, it's really strange that you're, you're actually, the three of you are applying for one grant. And because it's, academia is also based on individualism as well, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Does that answer your question? Yeah, it answered that and then so. <laughs> and it's actually <laughs> it's like the perfect segue when we're talking about like restructuring and power and structure in an organization and like the opposition of white supremacist culture is kind of rampant in the arts in Canada. And that brings me to like Ravi, but also like I have questions coming in from the audience. I am going to get to that. And before I get to that, I'm going to prompt Esquay because there's a really important question that I have that's like been sitting on me versus like the, also the faults of this allyship and what's happening um, with something like the BLM movement and the distractions or the things that it takes away from like larger issues that aren't just about um, BLM. So that will be my, my last question before I go to some of the questions in the audience and I might come back to my own personal questions because I got so many. Um, but in terms of, uh, Brad, you know, hmm? what were you gonna say? I was, just gonna, I was just gonna add a thought for us to think about when we're talking yeah. about allyship. There's been a lot of really incredible work around being an accomplice. And so I just thought it would be good for us to kind of kick around as the scholar on the panel, you know, to think about the kind of intellectualism around words and specific what those words have actions. And so, you know, within the indigenous community, we've done a lot of talking around what, what's the difference between an ally and an accomplice. And for us, an accomplice means that somebody that's gonna get down in the dirt with you, that like, if in fact mm -hmm. the blockade comes and they're gonna be arrested the same as you, you know? And so I think that, I think that they have different jobs and have different meanings. And I just want to kind of throw that to the group to think about. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many do's and don'ts of allyship too, right? Like and, and Esquay had a really good point about words that we'll touch on when I get into um, that question for her. 
So thank you for raising that up because there are some key points that I want to throw out there. As, as I said, this isn't necessarily like, let's do the work for you. Um, but there are some key points that I want to recap at the end. And there are some links even that I, that I've gotten from a few of you that people can go to. Um, but before I do that, back to uh, Ravi, what I find really interesting, and I keep saying this, is that like Why Not Theatre has, again, been doing a lot of the work. Uh, and I know that you have the Provoke stream, which is like kind of continuing online, something that kind of started before all of this. Um, but your whole your whole ideology is kind of like the power structure in an organization. And like I said, the, op the opposition of the white supremacist culture. And I think that that's really important that you yourself as a man of color um, are still feeling that you need to provide allyship in, in different ways, uh, even for an organized, like for with an organization that's been doing the work. And then I also like, so I kind of want to hear a little bit more about Provoke Stream, this gen, like the female BIPOC uh, mentorship programming and the system, uh, this, uh, I guess the systemic changes that you're making in your own organization with like anti-oppression anti -oppression training, like power hoarding and why you feel that's important now um, more than ever in terms of like the claim of allyship in your, in your practice. Yeah, I'll try and unpack that. Um, so basically the Provoke Stream for us, the only reason why I have a theater company is because I wanna make change in the world and, and we're all artists. And that's fundamentally why we do this. And so theater's like a third of what we do. A big part of our time is spent on provoking change in the ecology, uh, trying to change systems and like make a difference in the world. And so in, in 2016, uh, you know, I managed to be in leadership roles in, in institutions. And I had a lot of people say to me, you know, you're so good, like you're so, you know, you're such a good leader where are the other leaders like you? We need to train the next generation so that we have more of you around. And I was like, what? What do you, no, what? No, that's not, that's a, that's again, just to Julie's point about individualism, it's what they want you to believe. I know that there were tons of amazing artists of color who were leading in communities all around the world. So I was like, okay, fuck that. Screw, sorry, screw that. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna let's let's yes the next generation is important but let's focus on this generation of leaders who's already doing it and they just need the power. So I brought together um, a bunch of leaders from all around the world to just have a conversation in Toronto, and that started to grow. Um, we we were basically hold, hosting these conferences that were engaging in this question of leadership and what people were doing to change their communities. And in 2020, which I guess is this year now, time is so strange. Um, we recognize that there's, you know, a major, um, you know, uh, as Isque was saying, so, so thank you for sharing about, about your diagnosis. And, you know, my wife in particular right now, I really see the amount of labor that uh, women of color, Black and Indigenous women, the amount of labor that you guys, you all do, it, it needs to be said and like shouted from the rooftops. It's, it's the impact that it has on you, the amount of work that you all do and the invisibility that you suffer um, is tremendous. And so um, for us, we started this program called uh, the This Gen Fellowship, which is uh, for female BIPOC leaders. And it was a national fellowship where we, just like Julie was saying, we paired up seven artists from across Canada, female BIPOC identifying art, a female identifying BIPOC artists and we paired them with uh, some of the world's best artists in a mentorship. And because of COVID, luckily uh, Zoom and everybody's time is available. So we were able to make these amazing partnerships to one, shine a light on the amazing female BIPOC leaders that are already doing the work in the industry and create avenues for, and opportunities for access for younger, for that next generation. Um, and just to say too, like I think something someone someone said earlier, and just I, what I also think is important for us as 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 people of color, Black and Indigenous people, we art artivism is our lives because we know we've been our space has been given to us because people had to fucking fight for us to be here, and all of what we do, I know I can I just know it from head nods, but also just because of who you are, everything you do is making space for other people always. And I think that's just such so fundamental to the to just our cultures and our understandings of our place in in a lineage, and um, yeah. So just just to throw that all out there and, and to say that. Thank you. 
-hmm. Thank you for sharing that. Um, Thank you for recognizing that. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, it's like, I will just say I had, I was doing another chat um, recently that sort of sparked this sentiment for me where, you know, the conversation about, uh, you know, allyship and, and, you know, what are we doing in this current climate and, and so on. And the person who was doing the, that I was doing the chat with um, started to speak about how he has, you know, changed his path and is using his platform differently and so on. And then when the question was directed at me, you know, before I, I, I sort of took a breath and then before I could say anything, he jumped in and, you know, in a sense said what you just did. And it, it's, so it's now the second time in a very short window that I feel, you know, like that kind of uh, honor coming back and I'm really grateful for it. So thank you, Ravi. Well, elaborate a little bit more thank too, because you. You, you told me this, like yeah. I think you should let them know what exactly you said. Well, okay, so the, um, the conversation was, we're both uh, gonna be performing at Stanford University in the coming future, <laughs> whenever things open up, yeah hopefully. And so the conversation was in this exact moment, how are we participating in the conversations around Black Lives Matter? And how are we uh, participating in showing our relationship and, and allyship and so on? And so th the gentleman that I was doing this chat with was expressing how he hadn't until recently, after attending a rally here in Winnipeg, um, had gone and started to make change in how he demonstrated his support and activism and he had never used his platform for that purpose before and he's an indigenous person so you know like his walk is going to be his walk regardless visibly identifiable right so you know for him um it was a new a new path and he was like he was deeply moved by the fact that all of this time he hadn't been um participating in those you know tougher conversations within the community and, you know, at kind of in society overall. And so when the conversation came to me, uh, he was just like, dude, like, when do we get to give Iskwe a break? She's been doing this since before I've been on stages. And I was like, oh man, like, you know, I'm not done, but thank you. Like just just that kind of, that that show of support. And Ravi, that that show of support is is, I find so regenerating. It's really, you know, like to have other people um, Esma, Julie, Ash, like, I, I feel, I, I don't want to speak for anybody here, but for myself, it's like those, those bits of, um, you know, honoring that work is so monumental. I was having, I'm going to rant for one quick second. I was hanging out with a friend, super traditional guy, and he was, he, you know, we go back and forth a lot. This was just the other day, and he starts telling me about how, you know, in, in you know like the traditional ways women are not chief they're not chiefs we can't have women chiefs it's he's like i don't i don't recognize it it's not you know it's not a thing and i was like all right we're gonna have to have a big chat here in a moment and then he's like no well the women aren't the chiefs because they're the senate they're the supreme court like they're the ones that we go to for all of the the true knowledge and the true understanding and the guidance and the chiefs are the ones who then you know like present the information and the idea that came from the Senate, that came from the Supreme Court. And it, you know, it's, I don't know how that fits in, but it just sort of felt like it did in that moment. <laughs> no, I, like, I, I completely understand. This kind of is like, I'm gonna use this up and then I have another question for Esma, I'm sorry. So like, this, this bears with me because there's so many questions that I think <laughs> need to be discussed here. Um, but because you brought that up, Esma, I'm gonna put this out to you and Julie. So here's the thing with, movements and hashtags and um, the performance of it all and bringing everybody into one larger discussion uh, during uh, a movement like what's happening right now with BLM. Here is the thing. Um, we quickly get into posting hashtags and posting about Ahmed uh, and, Bri and Briona and George and calling out all of the Karens and it becomes this whole thing. Uh, but then what I also feel like is while movements like this can be great for cultural, political, and social shifts, we've also discussed how amidst the BLM protests, something like three Indigenous peoples were killed by police and it made no splash in the media, it made no waves, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I want to hear from Julie and I want to hear from, I want to hear from anybody actually, because all of you guys could have something to say here. 
Um, but what are your thoughts on the importance of BLM versus the importance of other atrocities that are happening parallel to this movement? Um, and I, you had something really good to say, Esque, I know about the use of language and, and like how every, you know, all of these different cultural have, have words that they use like genocide and slavery. Um, but I want kind of want to hear from the panel, how do you feel about uh, like BLM versus like the other atrocities that are happening? And I've heard different um, answers for this. So I'm really open to hearing all of yours. That I, I think for me, I think it's a collective struggle. Like I think that, you know, when we look at, you know, what's happening, and I mean, I'm going to talk, I'm going to focus mostly on the prairie provinces, and it's true, we were, I was smiling and laughing because there's lots of texts about this stupid bug that apparently really likes my <laughs> You have so, a new uh, pet horse fly. I know, I was like, I was like, go away, I'm trying to have a chat. Anyways, um, I think that it's, <laughs> I think that it's really important in terms of to have collective strength, and I think it goes to even back to, like, thank you, Ravi, for your kind words. It's just like, so refreshing because it doesn't normally go out of men's mouths and so it's like so lovely to hear and it's true it's a big weight to carry and I think that because it's a big weight to carry the more we collaborate and, and work collectively together as BIPOC leaders and and doing this incredible important work I just think it's it strengthens all of us it doesn't weaken us and I think that you know the stuff in terms of you know within the prairie provinces you know, our racial profiling is from our community. It is indigenous. It is, you know, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, you know, and it's not to say that people of color and um, black folks don't struggle in, in different aspects when it comes to enforcement. But within the context of the three prairie provinces, you know, the racial profiling is basically indigenous and non. And I'd say that, you know, we look at those cases and I know that one of the young girls that was lost was one of my, my sister's students. And so, you know, I, and I, my, my heart breaks because we've just recently had a young loss around the same age. And I can't even, even begin to understand the impact of what that would be like for that family specifically. And I think the fact that it doesn't make the news, you know, there was a small write up that there were three uh, murders and I wanna say it was end of March, beginning of April. And I also think we have, because we have this incredible moment to, you know, Ravi, you said like, now's the opportunity to change and do these things because we have this opportunity. At the same time, the flip side of that is that there are opportunities within the kind of structures like white supremacy, like police um, brutality. It's like they're also on heightened alert as well, right? So then there's also, there's nobody kind of, the community isn't policing them. And if we look to scholars like Jane Jacobs, who says, you know, it's not police that makes our community safe. It's actually people in the streets that make us safe. And in COVID, we're not allowed to be in public space. And as soon as we're not in public space, we can't be the eyes and ears of our community to be able to hold people accountable the same way. So, you know, I had to read that article from my news feed. Actually, it was my partner in crime who read it to me because he's the news guy. And so, you know, I, I, and then talking to my sister and then having to listen to all of that bits and parts. And I think that it's so incredibly important in this moment that we collaborate and we think about how to work together. And it's so much bigger and it could be um, more impactful, the more bodies and the more, voices that we have at the table we will be in we will run the show eventually <laughs> right so you feel that there's a strength in numbers right now and in keeping together in the strength of numbers per cause is a little stronger than separating is that what you're saying yeah i think that it's important to understand that each geographic space has its own distinct understandings and principles so you know my context within manitoba is very different than the toronto context right and so I think that, you know, if we, I think about Winnipeg versus Toronto or, um, you know, Saskatoon versus Montreal, whatever, I think that we have geographic specific, specific sorry, information that actually impacts different people and their lives differently. Toronto has 45% of the population coming from outside of Canada. It's one of the most highly racialized and diverse cities in Canada. It's going to have a different political um, demographic, different kinds of racial profiling and issues that are happening in that city that then Winnipeg, which has the highest indigenous population in the country, right? So I think that it doesn't mean that they're, that we have to all be the same to collaborate. In fact, it means that we have to be able to understand where each person is coming from and their learned and embodied knowledge and then work together to figure out how to make the place, a, make the world a better space. Okay, okay. fair enough, fair enough. That's why I know you had something to say. Do you want to, do you want to say something really quickly about that question there? 
Um, I mean, I think like, no, not really. Like, I, I think really what you've just said is, is very on, very on point to ex how I feel and how I would see it. Um, Ash and I were having a chat earlier today about the use of words and who mentioned that in this chat? There've been so many great thoughts that now I can't remember the, the use of language. Julie. Julie. Yeah. Um, one thing that I, in all of this, as I've been looking at, and paying attention and kind of, you know, uh, reflecting on, you know, how we keep cycling through and, and, and so like cycling through these situate or these circumstances and, and so on. It made me realize that, um, or made me think anyways, about our use of language and how uh, it, as indigenous people, we don't have a word that is recognized for our collective experience. And I'm, I, I often wonder if that is plays a part in kind of like how, how we sit in society, right? So in terms of like people identifying um, that, that connection to an understanding of experience when there's a lack of description that can go along with it, it creates a further separation. And to come back to what you just said, Julie, I think it is extremely important for that separation to be the thing that we pluck out first and say, listen, these experiences are different from each other because we're different from each other. However, it all comes back to we're feeling pain here because this is our loved one. And how can we come together over the fact that these are our loved ones and none of us want to experience that. Thank you. Thanks for that. If anyone else wants to chime in here, please do. If not, I'm going to jump really quickly to Esma and then I'm going to take a question um, from the audience because we have a, I'm getting a time check. Even though we always go over Harbor Front, come on. <laughs> um, so just, no one else wants to chime in on that one, right? right. Okay, great. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pivot really quickly back to Esma because I think that all of us here obviously are people who have done the work for the BICOC. Um, community, uh, we also are of the BIPOC community, but then it lends um, the question of for those who are not part of the BIPOC, BIPOC, BIPOC community, how do they show up? And I think that that's also a term of like, I'm trying to understand allyship versus performing allyship versus meaningful allyship, right? And I know that's a question I've been on many panels myself. I'm sure all of you guys have. I'm sure you've had the personal messages and the DMs and all of the questions um, from your all buy and pop folk about how do I show up? I feel confused. How do I help? I feel like I'm getting shut down. I feel like I'm getting shamed. Um, all of the above. And I know it's a difficult time, right? I say this all the time. It's a difficult time for non bipop folk to figure out how they fit into the conversation. However, ESMA is represented by Georgia Sherman um, uh, projects. And I feel like that's a really interesting relationship. And I think a lot of our audience, and I personally want to know um, how that relationship came about because she is obviously a white, well, not obviously, you don't, you don't know what she is, but she is a white woman. <laughs> um, and I think that ESMA has entrusted her with her career. And, and being represented by her. And I think that we also need to understand that like I work like Harborfront, I work with some folks that are not BIPOC. I like this whole block for black um, thing that I just did on Queen Street. I did it with two women who were white as well. Um, and they got a lot of slack. And I think we have to also unpack how these relationships happen and why we trust them and what, why we lean towards the people that we do work with and how they're showing up and doing the work. So I would be really interested in hearing kind of how that relationship came about, Esma. And uh, like really yeah. like what you feel like Georgia is doing um, for you as, a, as an ally. For sure. I really want to champion Georgia because I don't feel like she gets enough credit for what she does. But she approached me at a time where so many galleries weren't giving me any mind because I was Black. And I tried and I tried with so many galleries. And then this gallerist really came out, did the research, came to me respectfully, asked for a studio visit and was just so well informed. Like I didn't feel like I had to teach her anything in the studio visit. I felt like everything I was talking about, she understood. And to me, that takes a certain level of understanding, a certain level of research um, that you have to do on your own. And what I've noticed and what I've seen from Georgia, which makes me respect her so much and is the reason really why I'm, with her and why I continue to be with her is because of the work I see her do outside of her practice as a gallerist. The work that I see her do within the community, the work that I see her do on herself constantly to continue to educate herself. She doesn't just sit there and go, 
you know what, I've learned what I've learned and that's it. She's always searching for more ways to better herself in these areas. And to me, that's something I really respect and hold dearly because, you know, it is hard to be a Black artist and to be making work about racialized issues and then to then teach your gallerist that is extremely hard. Like I'm tired of teaching people. I'm tired of talking and telling people why I'm hurt. Like we've talked about this like throughout the conversation, but like, I know it's gonna be a bad thing to say, but I'm tired of being black. Like I'm tired of having to constantly be telling people why, why and what I've gone through. So to me, it's so refreshing to have a gallerist like Georgia because she does the work and it doesn't take the emotional and the draining energy that it would take for other gallerists to understand my work. So I really appreciate the angle that Georgia approaches um, her gallerist practice. I appreciate the work that she does outside of her practice for our community that mainly goes unseen and untalked about. And to me, I appreciate that because it's what you do when people aren't looking. It's not right. the optical allyship. It's not posting on Instagram. It's not, you know, telling everybody you are doing this, this, and this. It's doing the work silently and not asking for credit and not expecting credit. And to me, that's exactly what Georgia does. Yeah. Amen to that. Um, I and- just, Ash, I just want to add one thing. I, I just want to, is that okay? Please, of course, Julie. Yeah. I just, um, I just think that also to the, the thing that I think is like, when I think about the important role that Carla plays within the work that we do is she's the one that takes those questions. She's the one that does some of that emotional labor. And I think that the fact that people like non-BIPOC people then reach out to the BIPOC people to ask what to do, it's like actually look to other white people who are doing a really good job in their field, who stand out, who collaborate and work with and do excellent work and then ask them what they think you should be able to do. Because I think that the problem is is that not only are we talking about the labor of within institutions that we work in and the labor in terms of the kind of larger art world, but but on top of that, it's like the emotional label of having to do work that I'm exhausted of doing. And I think what Esma says is like, I'm not looking to teach a gallerist. The gallerist can do the Google background work on me and actually know what it is that they're doing. And right now with Nui, we're working on podcasts, working with a great guy, and he'd actually spend time understanding the work that I do and for me it was such a refreshing moment of like oh I don't have to explain myself and so it was great and I think that more people should do that and I think it's a good example right and um speaking of examples I know I said that this necessarily wasn't uh we'll do the work for you type of deal but um I did stumble when I was talking to Ravi and when um I've been doing a lot like even as us we do our own research, like the work never stops, right? We're constantly reading up on articles and doing the work as well. But just because I know we're nearing the end of this conversation and I'll, I'll just do the one question that came in earlier. Um, some resources, I'm gonna have Harborfront post them into the chat, just things and I'm only doing this because I felt that this was very important dialogue to ingest. Um, and something that came in too from Robbie was, uh, it's called White Supremacy Culture, it's a White Supremacy Culture article. Um, from 2001, which I mean is very telling. It was 2001 by Tema Ukun and Kenneth Jones. Did I say that right, Ravi? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Um, called Manufacturing a Sense of Urgency in Developing a Culture of Defensiveness. I thought that um, that should be posted into the group chat. And then there's there's two others, there's three others. Uh, there's one that came in uh, from a t- former TV producer for uh, The Social. I think it's socializing around right now, but Kathleen Newman, Freeman, I hope I said that right, a senior writer for Refinery29, just like for, the, it's called for Black Women in Media, a dream job is a myth. So good, really important. References, I know you're laughing, but it's true. I mean, it's true. Um, you refer, it, She references so many good um, uh, discussions that have happened, people who have stepped down, who have left jobs at CBC, at CTV, and calling out Bell Media. Like, I know they're all putting out their statements. This is what this conversation is about. There's real hard, um, realities to face. And I think, um, in, as Julie is saying, like part of this discussion is you have to understand when to do the work and when to impact this yourself and under, like take some time to like self-reflect. And in that self-reflection also understand like these microaggressions, these oppre- this oppression, this systemic 
um, the systemic uh, oppression that's been happening is like all of this is available to you. Like there's people who are leaving jobs, who are stepping down, who have said things on television. Look them up, do the work. Amanda Paris posted something about Canadian cultural institutions being silenced and Black voices for years. That's also in there. So Matt's gonna, Matt, no, well, I'm pulling out Matt, but Harbor Friend is going to post these resources <laughs> For you, please take a look. Some of them are really good articles. Um, lastly, the last question that came in, and then we'll close it out. Uh, sorry, was a question from uh, the chat. I'm a high school teacher and I'm a community activist. Is there a way to create a space for communities and educators to engage new BIPOC artists for the purpose of creating meaningful allyship? That goes out to anybody on this live. Can you say that question again? I will read it slower because I'm a fast talker. Um, <laughs> I'm a high school teacher and I'm a community activist. Is there a way to create space for communities and educators to engage new BIPOC artists for the purpose of creating meaningful allyship? I think so. How so? <laughs> Does anyone want to tackle that? If not, then I'll just go ahead and... Yeah. I think that just, yeah, yeah. I think just what you said. Some of the resources that are there, like you're, if you're a teacher or an educator, there's so much information. And I'd say one of the best things about COVID is like everything's being recorded, including this conversation. So you can like, you know, and you can look up all those resources. And you're, and as a, as a, as a professor, I'm gonna have so much more material to show students and have those kind of really good, pithy, awkward dialogues with students. And I think that. You know the resources are there for sure. Yeah. Does anyone else want to tackle that? I don't have anything substantial to add to that. For, for, I get it because it was specifically for educators, but I mean, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna echo that. Um, I, I mean, part of education. I still think education is an institutionalized bit, and I think if we're talking about being an activist and we're talking about creating allyship, you have to, it's, it's in who we hire, who we bring into these boards, who we bring into these staffs. Mm -hmm. um, so part of al allyship is actually like looking to the left and right of you and seeing who's sitting at the table and making sure that the right, like, the right representation is at these seats um, in the school systems as well. Like that's all part of this conversation. I don't have somebody, well, no, Julie, you, you are working in the education system, but I've also been a professor at Harbor, at, at Harbor Front, at Humber, um, and being one of the only people of color, um, like I think that that now I'm sitting on their their advisory committee committee to help shift um, uh, the program that I was teaching. Like I think that that is a big part of that work. If you're talking about creating space um, for educators to in, in, engage uh, BIPOC artists, like you have to employ the BIPOC staff <laughs> to do that. You know what I mean? I think it's uh, like, these are the small things that we don't consider. Um, yeah. So anyways, uh, if no one, does anyone have anything else to add to this conversation? Well, I'm not said, three more hours, <laughs> yeah. A lot. Huh? I said, we talked about so much. <laughs> That's the whole point, man. Like, yeah, you're going to do it. We're going to do it properly. So thank you to everybody who's tuned in. Thank you um, to, uh, you know, Esquay, Julie, Esma and Ravi for all the work that you do, but also for taking time um, in the midst of all of this to share your insights and your personal journeys. They're amazing. And I think we've all learned a lot from each other. And I'm just gonna shout out Trey Anthony one more time, my partner in crime. She has her uh, episode coming up, her next session coming up on Saturday at 7.30, um, talking about black motherhood and raising black sons during this time. And, uh, Ashley, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Ashley, thank, thank you. So you. Thanks yeah. for having us. Thank you. I'm taking a selfie now, guys. <laughs> oh, wait. <laughs> bug. We have to make sure the bug gets in that photo. <laughs> yeah, we're going to get that photo. Everybody, <laughs> say cheese. Great. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for joining us, Ash. Lovely to meet Thanks. all of you. Thank you so Thanks. much. Yeah. We're amazing. So nice. Bye, everybody. Bye, guys. <laughs>